welcome back to my channel. In this video, we will be learning about neurotransmitters and reflex activity. First, we will be looking at neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitter is a chemical substance that acts as a mediator for the transmission of nerve impulses from one neuron to another through a synapse. For those who don't know what is synapse, you can refer to my previous video that is part 4 of the CNS. Now let's look at the classification of neurotransmitters. We have two types of classification. First is depending upon the chemical nature and second is depending upon the function. First, depending upon the chemical nature, we have amino acids, amines and others. Now under the group of amino acids, we have the example of neurotransmitter that is GABA and glycine, GG, GABA and glycine. In amines, we have examples of noradrenaline and adrenaline, adrenaline, noradrenaline. And finally, we have others. Uh, example is nitric oxide. So we have done with the classification that is depending upon the chemical nature. Now looking at depending upon the function, neurotransmitters are of two types. First is excitatory neurotransmitter and second is inhibitory neurotransmitter. The excitatory neurotransmitter is responsible for conduction of impulses from presynaptic neuron to postsynaptic neuron. Example is acetylcholine and noradrenaline. And second is inhibitory neurotransmitters. It inhibits the conduction of an impulse from the presynaptic neuron to postsynaptic neuron. Example is GABA and dopamine. Now after looking at the classification, we will be learning about some of the important neurotransmitters. Here we have 8 important neurotransmitters. First is acetylcholine, noradrenaline, dopamine, serotonin, histamine, gamma aminobutyric acid, substance P and nitric oxide. Let's look at each one of them in detail. First is acetylcholine. It is a cholinergic neurotransmitter. It possesses excitatory function. Now, the acetylcholine receptors are muscarinic receptors and nicotinic receptors, which means that when this neurotransmitter called acetylcholine is released from the synapse, it goes and attaches to the muscarinic type of receptors and nicotinic type of receptors. Now, the second neurotransmitter is noradrenaline. Now, this neurotransmitter is mainly seen in adrenergic nerve fibers. In ma many of the places, it acts as an excitatory neurotransmitter, whereas in few places, it acts as an inhibitory neurotransmitter. The third neurotransmitter is dopamine. It is secreted by the nerve endings and dopamine produces an inhibitory action. Now, the fourth neurotransmitter is serotonin. It is otherwise known as 5-hydroxytryptamine, 5-THT. 5-hydroxytryptamine. Large amount of serotonin is found in the enterochromaffin cells of the gastrointestinal tract. It is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. The fifth type is histamine. Now histamine is secreted in the nerve endings of hypothalamus and the limbic cortex. It is an excitatory neurotransmitter. Now the earlier ones that is dopamine and serotonin were inhibitory neurotransmitters. Here histamine is an excitatory neurotransmitter. The, it, it plays an important role in arousal mechanism. Now the sixth neurotransmitter is gamma aminobutric acid. It is an inhibitory neurotransmitter in synapses, particularly in the CNS. It is responsible for presynaptic inhibition. The seventh neurotransmitter is substance P. It is a neuropeptide that acts as both a neurotransmitter as well as a neuromodulator. It mediates pain sensation in the body. Now the last type of important neurotransmitter is nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is a neurotransmitter in the CNS. It acts as a mediator for the dilator effect of acetylcholine on the small arteries of our body. So it basically acts as a mediator for acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is another neurotransmitter. So it acts as a mediator for acetylcholine for the dilation effect of it on small arteries. Peculiarity of nitric oxide is that it is neither produced by the neuronal cells nor stored in the vesicles. It is produced by non-neuronal cells. Now we have completed neurotransmitters. Let's move on to reflex activity. Before I begin with reflex activity, we all know that when our hand touches a very hot object, as a response, our hand moves backward, that is away from it. So, that hot object is giving us a peripheral nervous stimulation and as a response, our hand moves backward, which is the reflex activity. Now, let's look at what is reflex activity. Reflex activity is the response to a peripheral nervous stimulation that occurs without our consciousness. 
It is a type of protective mechanism and it protects our body from irreparable damage. Now let's look at reflex arc. It is a nervous pathway for a reflex action. So for this action that took place, there is a pathway that happens. That pathway is called the reflex arc. A simple reflex arc includes five components. Now we're going to st study it in detail. First is receptor. It is the end organ which receives the stimulus. Okay, we have our hand is the one touching the hot object. So it has certain receptors on our skin. So it is the, so the receptors are the end organs which receives the stimulus when the receptor is stimulated. Impulses are generated in the afferent nerve. A-F-F-E-R-E-N-T. Afferent nerve. So the second component of the reflex arc is the afferent nerve. The afferent or sensory nerve transmits sensory impulses from the receptor to the cortex. Now the third component of the reflex arc is the center. It receives the sensory impulses via the efferent nerve fibers and in turn generates appropriate motor impulses. It is located in the brain or the spinal cord. Now the fourth component of the reflex arc is the efferent nerve that is E-F-F-E-R-E-N-T, efferent nerve. The efferent or the motor nerve transmits motor impulses from the center to the effector organ. That is the action of pulling away our hand from the hot object. That is an impulse that is given, that is a motor impulse. So it is given via efferent nerve. Now the fifth component of the reflex arc is the effector organ. It is a structure such as muscle or a gland where the activity occurs in response to a stimulus. So finally taking away of the hand. It is done by the effector organ. Now let's look at the classification of reflexes. Reflexes are classified by six different methods. First is depending upon whether it is inborn or acquired reflexes. Second depending upon the situation that is the anatomical classification. Third is depending upon the purpose that is physiological classification. Fourth is depending upon the number of synapse. Fifth is depending upon whether it is visceral or somatic reflexes. And sixth is depending upon the clinical basis. Now let's look at each of these classifications in detail. The first classification is depending upon whether the reflexes are inborn or acquired. According to this we have two types. First is unconditional or inborn reflexes and second is conditioned or acquired reflexes. First let's look at unconditioned or inborn reflexes. These are natural reflexes which are present since the time of birth. Such reflexes do not require prior training or conditioning. Now example is the secretion of saliva when any food is placed inside the mouth. Now the second type is conditioned or acquired reflexes. These reflexes are developed after conditioning or training. They are acquired after birth and require previous learning or conditioning. Example is the secretion of saliva by sight, smell, thought or hearing of a known edible substance. Now the second classification is depending upon the situation of the reflexes that is anatomical classification. According to this reflexes are classified into five types. First is cerebellar reflexes. These reflexes have a center in the cerebellum. Second is cortical reflexes. These have the center in the cerebral cortex. Third is medullary reflexes or it is also called as bulbar reflexes. They are they have the center in the medulla. Fourth is midbrain reflexes which have the center in the midbrain and fifth is spinal reflexes which have the center in the spinal cord. So we learnt of five. First is cerebellar, cortical, midbrain, bulbar or medullary and spinal cord. The third classification is depending upon purpose that is physiological classification. Reflexes are classified depending upon its functional significance. According to this we have two types of reflexes. First is protective reflexes and second is anti-gravity reflexes. Let's look at the first one that is protective reflexes which is also called flexor reflexes. They protect the body from harmful stimuli. They are also called withdrawal reflexes or flexor reflexes. Now the example of this is while touching a hot object our hand immediately comes off of it. So this is an example of protective reflex. Second is anti-gravity or extensor reflex. It protects the body against the gravitational force and causes extension of all joints by contracting the extensor muscles. Now the fourth classification of reflexes is depending upon the number of synapses. Depending on the number of synapses, there are of two types. First is monosynaptic reflexes and second is polysynaptic reflexes. 
In monosynaptic reflexes, they have only one synapse in the reflex arc. Example is stretch reflex. Second is polysynaptic reflexes, which has more than one synapse in the reflex arc. Example is flexor reflexes. Now, the fifth classification is depending upon whether the reflexes are somatic or visceral reflexes. In somatic reflexes, the reflex arc is made up of somatic nerve fibers. In visceral reflexes, at least a part of the reflex arc is formed by autonomic nerve fibers. Example is coughing, swallowing, vomiting, etc. These are the examples of visceral reflexes. Now, the last classification, that is the sixth classification, is depending upon the clinical basis. According to this, we have four. That is, first is superficial reflexes, deep reflexes, visceral reflexes, and pathological reflexes. We look at this classification in detail. Now, let's look at superficial reflexes in detail. These are elicited from the surface of the body. These reflexes are elicited from cornea or conjunctiva of the eyeball, from the mucous membrane, and from the skin. Now, let's look at the superficial reflexes that are originated from the mucous membrane, that is mucous membrane reflexes. Now, under mucous membrane reflexes, I'm going to tell you about four reflexes. First is corneal reflex, second is conjunctival re reflex, third is pharyngeal reflex, and fourth is uvular reflex. Now, all these reflexes are written as a tabular form right here with reflex written in one column the stimulus written in the other column and response on the third column. So, I am going to tell you the name of the reflex, the stimulus and the particular response. First is corneal reflex. The stimulus is irritation of the cornea and the response to it is blinking or the closure of the eye. Second is the conjunctival reflex. The stimulus is irritation of the conjunctiva and response is similar as that of corneal reflex that is blinking or the closure of the eye. Now, the third reflex is pharyngeal reflex. In this, the stimulus is irritation of the nasal or mucous membrane. The response is retching or gagging. Fourth reflex is uvular reflex. The stimulus is irritation of the uvula and the response is raising of the uvula. Now, those were the mucous membrane reflexes. Next, let's look at cutaneous or the skin reflexes. Under that, I have mentioned about eight reflexes. Let's look at each one of them. They have also been written as a tabular form. I'll be telling you the reflex, the stimulus and the response, particular response. First is scapular reflex. The stimulus is irritation of the skin and, and the intrascapular space. That is the space between the two scapular bones. Now, the response to this stimulus, that is the irritation of the skin and the intrascapular space, the response that is produced is the contraction of the scapular muscles and drawing in of the scapula. That is, it goes like this. Second reflex is the upper abdominal reflex. The stimulus is stroking the abdominal wall below the coastal margin. And the response is ipsilateral contraction of the abdominal muscles and movement of umbilicus towards the side of the stroke. Now, what is ipsilateral contraction? The contraction occurs towards the same side where the stimulus was provided. Third is lower abdominal reflex in that the stimulus is stroking at the umbilical and iliac level. Now, the response is similar to that of upper abdominal reflex, that is, ipsilateral contraction of the abdominal muscles and movement of umbilicus towards the side of the stroke. Fourth is cremastric reflex. The stimulus is stroking the skin at the upper and inner aspect of thigh, and the response is elevation of the testicles. Fifth reflex is gluteal reflex. The stimulus is stroking the skin over the buttocks, and response is contraction of the gluteal muscles. Sixth is plantar reflex. The stimulus is stroking the sole of the foot and response is plantar flexion of the toes. That is, if this is the leg and if there is the stroke, uh, stroking reflex, the plantar reflex, there is stroking of the sole and there is plantar flexion of the toes. Eighth is anal reflex. The stimulus is stroking the perianal portion and response is contraction of the anal sphincter. Now, we have completed the superficial reflexes. Let's look at the deep reflexes. These reflexes are elicited from the deeper structures known as tendon reflexes. Now, in that we have, I have mentioned seven reflexes and they are also been written in a tabular form. I will be telling you in the same way as I told you about the superficial reflexes. First, let us look at the reflex which is called jaw jerk. 
The stimulus is tapping the middle of the chin with slightly open mouth. We will be tapping it. And response will be the closure of the mouth. Now, second reflex under deep reflex is biceps jerk. Tapping the stimulus is tapping on the biceps tendon. And response is the flexion of the forearm. Third is the triceps jerk. Now the stimulus is tapping of the triceps tendon that is behind the biceps is the triceps. So we will be tapping the triceps tendon and the response is the extension of the forearm. In biceps jerk there was flexion of the forearm. In triceps jerk there will be extension of the forearm. Fourth is the supinator jerk. The stimulus is tapping over the tendon on the styloid process of the radius and the response is the supination of the forearm. Fifth is the wrist tendon or the finger flexion reflex. In this, the stimulus is tapping of the wrist tendon and response is the flexion of the corresponding finger. Sixth is the knee jerk or the patellar tendon reflex. Here the stimulus is tapping the patellar tendon and response is the extension of the leg. And seventh, finally, we have the ankle jerk or the Achilles tendon reflex. In this, the stimulus, stimulus is tapping the Achilles tendon and response is the plantar flexion of the foot. Now, we have completed studying the deep reflex. So, we have covered the superficial reflex, the deep reflex. Now, we are moving on to the visceral reflexes. These are the reflexes arising from the pupil and the visceral organs. Under that, we have three types. First is pupillary reflex, second is oculocardiac reflex and third is carotid sinus reflex. So let's look at pupillary reflex. In this, the size of the pupil is altered and under that we have three reflexes. First is light reflex, second is accommodation reflex and third is olivospinal reflex. First let's look at light reflex. Now when there is a, uh, in this light reflex, there is constriction of pupil when it is stimulated by a sudden flash of light, for example with a torch. And under it, it is of two types, that is direct and indirect light reflex. Then we have the accommodation reflex in the pupillary reflexes, in that there is changing of vision from a distant to a near object. For example, if we are first focusing on a, a thing that is far away from us and immediately when a pencil is brought in front of us, our vision that is our accommodation reflex works and our focus moves to the pencil that is near us. So there the accommodation reflex works. Then we have the olivospinal reflex under the pupillary reflexes. In this there is dilation of the pupil due to stimulation of skin over the neck. There is dilation of pupil. Now after pupillary reflexes, second is the oculocardiac reflex. In this, there is decrease in heart rate due to the pressure applied over the eyeball. Now the third is carotid sinus reflex. There is decrease in heart rate as well as BP that is blood pressure caused by pressure over the carotid sinus in the neck due to a tight collar. We learned about visceral reflexes. So we have covered superficial, deep and visceral reflexes. Now let's move on to the last that is pathological reflexes. Now they are elicited only in pathological conditions. We will be learning about three types. First is Babinski reflex, then is clonus and pendular movements. First let's look at Babinski reflex. It is the abnormal plantar reflex due to the upper motor neuron lesion. In normal plantar reflex, a gentle scratch over the outer edge of the sole of the foot causes plantar flexion of the foot. But in here, that is in Babinski reflex, there is dorsiflexion of the great toe and fanning of the other toes. Now the second pathological reflex is clonus. Clonus is a series of rapid and repeated involuntary jerky movements which occur while eliciting a deep reflex. Due to hypertonicity of muscles, there is increased tone of muscles that is hypertonicity of muscles which, is, which occurs due to pyramidal tract lesions. Clonus is well seen in calf muscles producing ankle clonus and in quadriceps muscles producing patellar clonus. Now the third is pendular movements. It is slow oscillatory movements that are developed while eliciting a tendon reflex. The pendular movements occur due to hypotonicity of muscle that is decreased tone of muscles. In the earlier one that is clonus there was hypertonicity increased tone of muscle. Here in pendular movements it is the oscillating movements due to 
hypotonicity that is decreased tone of the muscles. In normal conditions, after the extension in while giving a patellar tendon jerk, uh, in normal conditions, after extending the leg, it returns back to normal, to resting position immediately. Hmm? But in cerebellar lesions, the leg swings forwards and backwards several times before coming back to rest. Now we have completed the classification of reflexes. Let us move on to the properties of reflexes. Here I have mentioned 9 properties. Let us look at them one by one. First is bell Majandi's law. The impulses pass from the receptors to the center and from the center to the effector organ. I have already talked about bell Majandi law in my earlier videos. Second property is reaction time. It is a time interval between the application of stimulus and the onset of the reflex. Now the third property is summation. I have already discussed summation in my earlier videos. It is actually when a subliminal stimulus is applied, it does not produce any response. But if two or more stimulus is applied at a short interval, it produces a response and this is called summation. It can be of two types, spatial and temporal. So this is one of the properties in the properties of reflexes. Let us move on to the fourth property that is occlusion. It is due to the overlapping of nerve fibers during the distribution and it occurs in multiple reflexes. Now the fifth property is subliminal fringe. Now in some reflexes involving the muscles with two nerve fibers, the tension developed by the simultaneous stimulation of the two nerves is greater than the sum of tension produced by the stimulations of nerves separately. It is due to the effect of spatial summation. Now what does this mean? If a nerve, if a muscle with two nerve fibers are stimulated together that is stimulated simultaneously, the tension that is produced when it is stimulated together is greater than compared to the stimulation that is given to a single nerve fiber separately. Now the sixth property is recruitment. Now in this where the, when there is increased muscular contraction, increased force of muscular contraction, there is additional recruitment of motor units. That is what is being said in this point that is recruitment. There is successive activation of additional motor units with progressive increase of contraction of muscles. Now the seventh property is after discharge. There is persistence or continuation of response even after the stimulus that is applied is stopped. Now the eighth property is rebound phenomenon. When an inhibition is suddenly removed, there is a more forceful reflex activity that takes place. That is what is being said in rebound phenomenon. Now the last property is fatigue. When a reflex activity is elicited for a long time, slowly the response is reduced and finally there is no response. So that is what is being said. When a reflex activity is continuously elicited for a long time, the response is reduced slowly and at a stage response does not occur at all. Now we have completed the properties of reflexes. Now let us look at reciprocal inhibition and reciprocal innervation. First let us look at reciprocal inhibition. The excitation of one group of muscles is associated with the inhibition of another group of muscles on the same side that is the, uh, the inhibition of antagonistic group of muscles on the same side. What is the example of this? When a flexor reflex is initiated for example the biceps uh, reflex, bicep tendon reflex when a flexor reflex is in elicited, the flexor muscles are excited, that is they are contracted. And extensor muscles, that is the triceps, are inhibited, that is relaxed in that same side. This phenomenon is called the reciprocal inhibition. Now let us look at what is reciprocal innervation, that is the Sherrington law. According to Sherrington law, Reciprocal inhibition, that is a phenomenon that we learnt earlier, is due to the segmental arrangement of efferent and efferent nerve fibers, that is efferent and efferent connections in the spinal cord. The efferent nerve fibers, that is A-F-F-E-R-E-N-T, efferent nerve fibers, which evoke, which initiate flexor reflexes in a limb, have connections with motor neurons supplying the flexors and motor neurons supplying the extensors of the same side. Which means that the efferent nerve fibers which start or evoke the reflex activity in a particular limb have connections with the motor nerves that supplies the flexor and extensor of the same side. Now we learnt about reciprocal inhibition and reciprocal innervation. 
Now let's look at the last topic for this video that is crossed extensor reflex. Now it is a withdrawal reflex in which the flexors of the withdrawing limb are contracted while the extensors of this limb are relaxed while the opposite happens in the other limb. I hope you found this video helpful. To get the notes of CNS, you can visit my Instagram page. It is available at a very minimal cost. The link to my Instagram page is given in the description below. To get updates on my latest videos, click on the subscribe button. To get notifications, tap on the bell icon. Thank you for watching.